welcome everyone to tonight's event. Uh, we're going to give people just a few seconds to filter into the event here, and we will get started. Welcome everyone to tonight's event. Uh, my name is Nate Olson. I'm the Associate Director of the Kegley Institute of Ethics. Um, very glad to have you with us this evening for tonight's event. Um, before I start, I wanna start by thanking the sponsors who've made tonight's event possible, including the Kegley family, Valley Strong Credit Union, Adventist Health, and Kaiser Permanente. Um, we're very pleased also to be partnering with CSUB's Pre-Law Society, uh, two of the student officers of the Pre-Law Society will join us tonight after Professor Ziegler's talk to ask her the first two questions. Um, after the students' questions, uh, Professor Ziegler will answer questions from you, the audience. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can see the Q&A button there at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, you can enter a question at any point. Um, during tonight's event, and it will come to us, and um, I will pose some of those questions to uh, Professor Ziegler after her, um, during the Q&A portion at the end of um, tonight's event. Okay, well, with that said, I'm very happy to introduce tonight's, uh, tonight's speaker, Professor Mary Ziegler, who's Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Law at UC Davis. She is an internationally recognized expert on the law, history, and politics of reproduction, healthcare, and conservatism in the US. She's written five books on the subject, including two that were published just this year, Reproduction and the Constitution and Dollars for Life, the Anti-Abortion Movement and the Fall of the Republican Establishment. And if that's not enough, she's also a frequent contributor to many different media outlets including the New York Times, PBS NewsHour, and the Washington Post. She's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. Her talk tonight is titled After Roe, Understanding Abortion and the Law in America. Professor Ziegler, thanks so much for taking the time to speak to the CSUB community tonight. Thanks for having me. So um, in, in the time I have with you, I'm, I'm hopefully mostly looking forward to your questions, but I wanted to talk a little bit about how we got here, here being the reversal of Roe, and then I wanted to talk about the Dobbs opinion, so kind of what, what the court said, and then finally where we are now. Um, so how this happened, I think, is complicated, and it's not primarily a story about um, there being new arguments for or against legal abortion. Uh, many of the arguments that the court heard, and in fact that the court made, are arguments that have been around since at least the 1970s. Instead, I think that kind of how we got here is more a, a story about how our political parties have changed, um, how our system of campaign finance has changed, uh, and even, I think, in fundamental ways, how the Supreme Court itself has changed. So what that means, in essence, is whether you're interested in this area of the law or not, um, our entire political system has shifted in some ways in response to the campaign to get rid of Roe that will affect, I think, all of us, regardless of um, whether or not we're invested in this issue or would be intimately touched by it. So if you start at the beginning, you'd start in the 1960s. Um, that isn't when abortion was mostly being criminalized in the US. There's a historical debate about exactly what attitudes were before the mid to late 19th century, but it was at that time that the American Medical Association began a campaign to criminalize abortion throughout pregnancy. Um, but that isn't really the kind of, I would say, the forerunner of what we have now in the American pro-life movement. That came in the 60s when states were beginning to reform existing criminal laws to allow, for example, for exceptions for things like rape or incest or certain um, fetal disabilities or um, health conditions for the, the patient. And in all of those cases, there was um, a movement that formed to oppose that, kind of what the forerunner of what we would think of as the American anti-abortion or pro-life movement. 
And at the beginning, um, that movement was pretty diverse uh, in some ways and not in others. It was a pretty white movement. Uh, it was a pretty middle class movement, generally socially conservative, but otherwise people in the movement disagreed about things like which party to vote for, whether there should be a bigger welfare state or not, um, whether the US should be fighting the war in Vietnam, and many other things. What the movement agreed on was this vision of the Constitution, namely that uh, the, there is um, the word person in the 14th Amendment, which covers both due process and equal protection of the law, applies before as well as after birth. And so that meant to people in the early pro-life or anti-abortion movement that abortion, what, liberal abortion laws were unconstitutional. They were violations of the right of this person. That vision of the Constitution was really the one that remained dominant, um, even after Roe. So Roe, of course, embraced the idea that uh, the right to privacy, in the, in, which is an unenumerated right, that right had been recognized in the past and the court had used it to recognize interests in you know, married couples' access to contraception, single people's access to birth control, the right to marry, uh, the right to parent, um, the right to cohabit with your blood family. And the court in Roe said this right is broad enough to encompass the decision to terminate a pregnancy. And the court explicitly rejected ideas about personhood. But that didn't really change the focus of people who were in the pro-life movement. Um, they, after Roe, turned to uh, a constitutional amendment. So they wanted an amendment that would ban abortion nationwide. So that meant in places like California, as well as in places where people were generally um, as a majority opposed to abortion. Uh, and to do that, that meant that the movement had to get more involved in politics. Both, I would say, the abortion rights movement and the anti-abortion movement before Roe were pretty active in state legislatures. They were pretty active in courts, but they didn't really do a whole lot in national politics. And neither political party was really identifiably pro-life or pro-choice. Um, if you had, you know, took, took his time machine back to like 1968 and said, which is the pro-life party and which is the pro-choice party, people would have looked at you like there was something wrong with you because there was no principled way to answer that question. Um, that remained the case uh, until the late 1970s, early 1980s. And that was a significant shift, I think, both in terms of the religious uh, organizations in the conflict around abortion um, and in terms of political organizing around abortion. So up until that time, uh, the largest percentage of people in the pro-life movement were Catholic. They weren't necessarily socially conservative across the board. Um, and it also wasn't the case that all Catholics were opposed to abortion, but the movement itself was heavily Catholic. Uh, white evangelical Protestants, who we may now identify with pro-life activism, largely were staying on the sidelines, in part because they were uncomfortable with what they saw as the Catholic movement, in part because large groups like the Southern Baptist Convention took the position that abortion on demand, as they would put it, was bad, but so too were, um, for example, uh, laws that criminalized all abortions. That began to change in the late 70s. Um, and Republican political operatives like Paul Weyrich of Wyoming became convinced that it would be possible to use the abortion issue to realign politics. Richard Nixon had come up with this idea in the 70s, uh, but then, of course, Richard Nixon had his own problems like Watergate and the demise of his political career, and no one had been in a rush to follow him. Uh, Gerald Ford had tried very hard to avoid the abortion issue at every turn. Jimmy Carter, um, who ultimately became president, carved out a position that neither movement liked. Uh, and it wasn't really until Ronald Reagan came on the scene that this idea of abortion as a wedge issue reemerged, a way to peel away uh, socially conservative Catholics and evangelicals who might otherwise have voted Democrat. So by the early 1980s, you could say that the Republican Party was the anti-abortion or pro-life party. The Democratic Party, which was becoming more responsive to people of color um, and women in its ranks, was becoming the more pro-choice party. And at the time, for a while, it seemed like that was a futile thing for the anti-abortion movement. The movement, notwithstanding having this partnership with the GOP, couldn't get a constitutional ban through Congress or the states. And the question became, well, what to do next? And the movement's answer was that if it couldn't change the text of the Constitution, it might be able to change who sat on the Supreme Court and change what the Constitution meant that way. And that was a new way of justifying this partnership with the GOP because Republican senators could vote to confirm Supreme Court justices and Republican presidents could nominate them. And so it seemed that all you would need to get the end of Roe v. Wade was Republicans in office, but it turned out not to be that simple. 
So by the 1990s, there was a Republican majority on the court and lots of hints that the court had dropped that was ready to reverse Roe. But then when the time came in 1992 in a case called Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the court actually declined to reverse Roe and preserved what it called the essential holding of Roe, namely that there was a right to choose abortion before viability or the point at which survival outside of the womb becomes realistic. Um, this decision, Casey, was kind of a, a crisis for people in the pro-life or anti-abortion movement because it suggested their entire strategy had been wrong. And when they were trying to make sense of what had happened, leading activists in the movement like James Bopp of the National Right to Life Committee concluded that the problem was that the movement didn't have enough influence in the Republican Party and that Republicans were nominating the justices who would be the easiest to get through Congress, um, justices who were um, both popular and plugged into popular opinion. And so on the one hand, some people in the pro-life movement argued, well, we need to do more to change popular opinion on abortion. Other people in the movement argued, we need to find justices who don't care about popular opinion at all, right? Who would be indifferent to the prospect of a post row backlash. And as a kind of model of the sort of judge they wanted, they held up Clarence Thomas. Now, they were enamored of Thomas because he was a self-identified originalist and textualist. We can talk about the, what those terms mean. They liked that he had been very critical of Roe on the kind of conference tour before his confirmation. But most of all, I think they liked his response to um, the accusations of sexual harassment made by Professor Anita Hill during his confirmation hearing. And in the face of these accusations, Thomas was defiant. Um, some thought he even sort of relished the opportunity for confrontation. And people in organizations like National Right to Life Committee believed that this was a proxy for how he would react um, when the moment came to overrule Roe. In other words, they thought he wouldn't shy away from it. So the question became how to get more justices like Clarence Thomas, who were not worried about offending potential voting majorities. And the answer for some people like Bob was money. Um, if the pro-life movement, the theory went, became more involved in campaign finance. That would allow the movement to gain more access in the inner circle of the GOP. It would help um, Republican candidates win elections who would be more likely to nominate people to the Supreme Court. And maybe if the movement played its cards right, it would lead to a change in the balance of power in the Republican Party. That is to say, away from what some people would call establishment Republicans, people who had been traditional leaders in the party, like committeemen, donors, people who had often been around for some time were focused on electability and toward kind of movement conservatives, whether those people belong to the pro-life or anti-abortion movement, the gun rights movement, um, and the like. So that, uh, the, that ca there came a time then when you had people in the pro-life movement joining and really it's sometimes leading a struggle against campaign finance reform, which seems counterintuitive in part because social conservative organizations don't tend to have a lot of money, right? When you think of who has skin in the game of campaign finance, you think of the Koch brothers, you think of people who have a lot of money to spend. Um, and that was certainly true, but groups like National Right to Life Committee did their best to convince other social conservatives to care about campaign finance. They framed campaign finance regulations as regulations that would always prioritize the interests of the legacy media um, and uh, interests of progressives at the expense of conservatives. Uh, the movement also tried to convince the GOP to be consistent about campaign finance, because while Republicans had traditionally done better in raising money than Democrats had, everyone tended to be opportunistic, right, which is to say Republicans liked campaign spending limits that hurt Democrats and not campaign spending limits that hurt Republicans. But again, um, it was anti-abortion groups that took the lead in, in pushing the GOP to frame this as a matter of principle rather than um, a matter of expedience. So anti-abortion groups led litigation of some of the most famous campaign finance cases you've heard of, including Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. That started out for the movement as a dark money case, right? The theory was that conservative donors often live in large progressive cities, sometimes in red states, sometimes in blue states, and they're unwilling to attach their name to donations. The reasons for that were evident um, in the aftermath of Proposition 8, which some of you may have heard of in California. It was an initiative to reinstate bans on same-sex marriage in the state. Uh, after Proposition 8 came out, because California has robust public records laws, 
There were lists posted almost immediately on websites like knowthyneighbor.org of people who had voted or donated to um, Proposition 8, and that led to lots of professional and personal ramifications for those people. And so for many conservative donors, the, the price of entry, right, their willingness to donate was conditioned on anonymity. So BOP and other anti-abortion lawyers were hoping in Citizens United that the Supreme Court would make it easier for people to make contributions anonymously. The Supreme Court didn't do that. Um, and as you may know, in Citizens United, the court instead said that there could be unlimited independent corporate expenditures. Um, that you would think might have helped for profit corporations. And it did, but it also was a kind of major development for ideological nonprofits like anti-abortion groups that were able to change the balance of spending in the GOP. In part, they were able to get candidates that would have been crushed before. So here I'll tell you the story of Pat Buchanan. Um, you probably are too young to remember Pat Buchanan. But Buchanan ran in 92 and 96 as a kind of Trumpian populist. Um, he was good TV, just like Trump. He would wave a pitchfork literally on the campaign trail. He would make fun of his opponent, Bob Dole, for being so boring that he thought he was in a funeral home. Um, and he also took very Trump-like positions on issues from you know, race to immigration. And uh, so Buchanan was really beloved by the by Republican primary voters, but um, he was not beloved by the Republican establishment, which thought that he would not only um, lose the general election, but potentially cost uh, candidates in the Republican Party down ticket votes as well. And so they used a tidal wave of money to crush him, right? Bob Dole had donors lined up and all almost all campaign spending in the time went through the party apparatus. After Citizens United, that was no longer true. There was lots of outside money running through super PACs and nonprofits. And that meant that the party couldn't do as much to sideline Donald Trump when he ran in 2016. Of course, Trump was the one who nominated three of the justices who decided the Dobbs decision. Um, and without him, it's almost unimaginable that we would have Dobbs. Having said that, right, there was nothing inevitable about Dobbs even then. Um, you needed to have Trump and the justices he put on the court. You needed to have a robust conservative legal movement um, and a conservative legal movement uh, led by the Federalist Society that was sensitive to the concerns of social conservatives as well as fiscal conservatives, which had not always been the case. That was a late breaking development in the 90s. Um, but there were coincidences, of course, as well. Uh, if, if Trump hadn't been elected, Dobbs wouldn't have been decided the way it was. If Ruth Bader Ginsburg had passed away earlier or later, Dobbs wouldn't have been decided the way it was. But yet I think these changes to campaign finance and to the GOP um, were necessary steps uh, in the creation of a court that I think in many ways wasn't as worried about popular opinion as it had been in the past. So what is Dobbs and what did it say? Uh, Dobbs involved a 15 week abortion ban. Um, this was not, I think at the time, a restriction that most court watchers were paying particular attention to. It was not seen to be one of the most strategically advantageous, but it was the first case that made its way to the court. And the court quite clearly, as it's currently constituted, had grave concerns about Roe and was interested in overruling it quickly. Uh, the court held um, not only that Roe was wrong, but that it was egregiously wrong in Justice Alito's words. Uh, he compared it in that way to Plessy versus Ferguson, a case on um, th that held upheld racial segregation laws and the idea of separate but equal. So this is sort of in, in constitutional law, the equivalent of like the worst name you can call somebody, right, is to, to compare something to Plessy. He rejected the idea that there's an equal protection, right? So that one of the leading arguments for abortion rights now, people would say in the academy, is that they're rooted not in privacy, but in equality, right? This was Ruth Bader Ginsburg's argument that uh, there were the framers of the 14th Amendment would have believed that forcing someone to carry a pregnancy to term raises equality concerns. The, Justice Alito said essentially, we can't talk about that because we've already decided in other precedents that pregnancy discrimination isn't sex discrimination. So we're not allowed to revisit it now. In terms of why he thought Roe was egregiously wrong, he suggested that the only unenumerated rights, right, that is to say rights not spelled out in the text of the constitution that exist are rights that are deeply rooted in history and tradition. And it wasn't exactly clear which history and traditions were the most relevant. He canvassed some history or at least one narrative about history. It's deeply contested. Uh, from the Middle Ages onward. 
But clearly the history that mattered the most to Justice Alito was the history at the time the 14th Amendment was written. And so Justice Alito said, at that point, it's clear that states were criminalizing abortion. And so if states were criminalizing abortion, there's no way to believe that states would also have thought abortion was a fundamental right. The dissenting justices and Justice Thomas <laughs> both said, uh, well, you know, what does that mean for other rights? Because isn't it the case, said Justice Thomas, that at the time the 14th Amendment was written, that contraception was criminalized at the national level and in many states? And wasn't it the case um, that certainly same-sex marriage would have been unthinkable at the time? And states broadly were criminalizing sodomy, right? So um, anal or oral sex. And at the time, I think beginning to define those acts as things that were identified with people who are queer, right? As opposed to just acts that anybody could be punished for or engage in. So if those are the only rights we have, right? Roots, rights deeply rooted in history and tradition, um, aren't those rights all in the chopping block? So Justice Thomas said yes. Justice Alito said no. Justice Kavanaugh, who wrote separately and probably cast the deciding vote in the case, also said no. Justice Alito's reassurances were based on the idea that abortion is different because it involves the taking of a fetal life. None of the justices addressed this idea of personhood, right? Um, they kind of left that for another day. What they essentially had to say is that each state will get to have its own say about abortion. The other things the justices said suggested they weren't as invested as in precedent, right? The idea that um, you have to respect past cases as, as a court. Uh, the, the majority said, you know, we think Roe is unworkable. We think it was egregiously wrong. And when it comes to whether people relied on it or not, we can't tell. But even if they did, the solution is for them to go vote. Right, we don't. We can't really know if they were relying on it one way or another. It's hard to see, given how the court handled that, um, whether respect for precedent holds the weight it once did on the court. And the same goes for concerns about legitimacy. So Chief Justice John Roberts had desperately been trying to get the court to slow down and overruling Roe in hope that that would um, preserve the court's power. Really, I think in Roberts' view, uh, and Alito addressed this concern and said there would be no way for the justices to know if the overruling Roe would damage their legitimacy, and even if they knew, they shouldn't care. So, and in fact, I think there's some sign that at least in the short term, um, uh, overruling Roe has affected the court's reputation, not entirely because people disagree with the decision, although I think that's true, but also because it's solidified a growing impression among voters that the court is partisan, whether the justices rendering decisions are progressive or conservative, people in the public like to believe that the court is above politics and they decreasingly believe that it is. Of course, the justices hoped that Dobbs would kind of put an end to the abortion debate for at least for the time being, the opposite seems to be true. Um, the aftermath of Dobbs has been, I think, a kind of period of chaos where we've seen conflicts between the federal and state governments, between different state governments, and even between local and state governments. So I'll try to sketch some of those out. Um, of course, these conflicts are just beginning. So after Dobbs, roughly half the states were ready with either a trigger law, a law that had been passed immediately to go into effect and ban abortion upon the overruling Roe, or what we call zombie laws, laws that had been on the books before Roe, um, they kind of sprang back into effect to criminalize abortion. Um, other states like California uh, had some protections for abortion um, that were already in place. But the tricky thing for states that wanted to ban abortion was enforcement, right? Because we now live in an era where you can get abortion pills over the internet, even in states where abortion is illegal, and people can and do often travel out of state for abortion to mobile clinics um, or nearby states. So how, what states with majorities of voters who don't like abortion, or at least with state legislatures that don't like abortion, are considering strategies to prohibit people from traveling out of state to get abortion, or even applying their criminal laws extraterritorially. So that is to say, to say that something that would be legal in the state where it occurs is illegal if that procedure is being done for someone from a state where abortion is a crime. We haven't really seen laws like this since the Civil War, and there's a lot of uncertainty about how courts are going to approach them. And we've seen some progressive states try to preempt this strategy by introducing what are called shield laws, essentially saying, if you try to indict our doctor, you try to subpoena our doctor, you try to say people were aiding and abetting, we're not gonna comply with any of that. So there's really intense 
divisions between the states in ways we haven't seen. There are divisions between the state and federal government, especially around emergency exceptions for abortion. The Biden administration has taken the position that a federal law called EMTALA or the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act requires states that have banned abortion to allow um, abortion in certain medical emergencies. The Biden administration has sued Idaho, saying it's, it's conflicting with federal law. Texas has in turn sued the Biden administration, saying that federal law has nothing to say about this. And the Biden administration is just invading states' prerogatives. All of that, of course, is heading back, guess where, to the Supreme Court, which is not done with this by a long shot. There are going to be, of course, many data privacy issues because states that are seeking ways to enforce new criminal laws are not going to be able to get people's medical records because of HIPAA as well as because of SHIELD laws. So what they're looking at instead is just good old fashioned data harvesting in the same way that people, when you go shopping for anything online and you start to see ads pop up for that, that's because targeted advertisers are buying your data. And if target advertisers can buy your data, so too can members of law enforcement. So we're going to see an era where law enforcement are going to be interested in um, people's uh, text messages, people's Facebook postings, people's uh, phone GPS data, which you may need a warrant for, people's period tracking app data, a variety of other things. So I think questions about, um, which are not new questions, but questions about digital privacy, I think are going to be asked with more urgency. The same goes, I think, for the line between speech um, and conduct. Uh, some groups um, who are uh, in states that are pro-life are arguing essentially that aiding and abetting, which is a term in criminal law we use for people who are assisting someone else in committing a crime, that that applies very broadly in the context of abortion. So they would say it applies to people who donate money to help somebody else get an abortion. It applies to companies that reimburse their employees for traveling out of state for abortion. It applies to uh, people who are um, posting information online about how to have an abortion. And it even applies to services like Google or that host websites that talk about abortion. So as you can imagine, a lot of those things I just said involve speech. And so there's going to be, I think, a very live debate about where the free speech clause of the First Amendment kicks in and where it doesn't. There'll be debates about what all of this means for other areas of the law. So what does it mean for the treatment of people who have incomplete miscarriages or stillbirths, both according to the letter of the law and according to how doctors interpret it, given the kinds of penalties they'll be facing. There'll be questions about whether any of this has implications either for some contraceptives, right? Um, in particular, I think people are watching implications for IUDs and emergency contraceptives, although some folks in the pro-life movement, like Students for Life, also take the position um, that the birth control pill is an abortive patient, so that might be an interesting point to watch, too. There'll be questions about what this means for um, the treatment of infertility, particularly for IVF. Uh, if a state bans abortion and recognizes personhood, does that mean, for example, that people have to implant all the embryos they create for IVF? Does it mean they won't be allowed to donate embryos for research anymore? Um, there are questions, I think, too, about whether personhood comes next, because that's, I think, the ultimate, always been the ultimate goal of the pro-life movement. It's not been to allow each state to do its own thing. It's been to have the same kind of national solution um, top down uh, that people on the pro-choice side wanted. Um, so far, the Supreme Court hasn't been interested in taking up personhood, but I think this is kind of very much a question of playing the long game. And that's true for people um, on the pro-choice side too. So I think if you're trying to kind of project forward about what we would expect, um, things that are clear are that there's a disconnect between American party politics and popular opinion on abortion. Um, most voters are in the middle uh, on this issue um, in a place that neither movement is and in some ways neither party is. Uh, and that's an unstable thing for democracy, right? I mean, there may be ways we could resolve that, but it's a kind of warning sign, I think, in a democracy when you have a longstanding disconnect in politicians who feel that that's not a problem. Uh, the other thing that we can be clear about is as much as Justice Alito may wish it weren't so, the Supreme Court is not in a position to resolve this and never was. So um, Harry Blackman, who is the author of Roe, had in his papers, um, he had clipped a little poll from the 70s saying something like 70 something percent of Americans think that abortion should be a decision between a woman and her doctor. And Blackman, I think, in clipping this thought, well, you know, we've figured this thing out, like we're going to issue Roe, 
people are going to be fine with it. And for several years, he, he had reason to think he was right. Um, Roe on ABC News the night it came down was the third most important story. Like if you've ever watched the news, it's like the thing that comes after the commercial break when a lot of people have turned off the TV. So it wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't that big of a deal in Supreme Court confirmations. Um, the first justice nominated after Roe came down was John Paul Stevens, and he was confirmed unanimously after being asked absolutely no questions about abortion. But over time, of course, there was a backlash that developed not just because of Roe, but because of the actions of a whole variety of other actors. And that's because Americans care deeply about this issue and they think about it in complicated ways that the court has had a hard time understanding. And so Justice Alito, of course, is no more qualified to stop Americans from thinking or talking about abortion than Justice Blackmun was. You could argue he's in an even worse position because at least in some ways, Justice Blackmun had the poll to clip to say that people agreed with him. There is no such poll that Justice Alito could find at the moment. So this conflict will probably be going on in another 50 years. Uh, in some way or another, and most likely it will be a constitutional one. Um, I think finally, if you're thinking about well, what does this mean for me, obviously if you're in college now, um, this could affect you personally, either if you're seeking an abortion or if you're in a pro-life organization. It could affect you personally if you get pregnant and have something go wrong, like a stillbirth or um, a miscarriage and your treatment is affected because you go to a specific hospital or you live in a specific state. Um, but as you can see, already this debate is changing the way people think of the First Amendment and free speech. It's changing the way people are thinking of surveillance and privacy. Um, it's changing the way our political parties have operated. It's changed the way the Supreme Court works and the Supreme Court that we have now is, would have been unrecognizable to my professors in law school. And so I think there's a tendency to say, okay, well, abortion, that's just a women's issue that doesn't really concern me, or abortion is kind of a religious issue, it's an issue of life, and if I don't think about that, it doesn't really concern me. But I, hopefully, if I've convinced you of anything today, it's that neither of those things are true. This is an issue that's affected um, almost every area of American life and will almost certainly continue to do so in the months and years to come. So I'll stop there and take your questions. Thank you so much, Mary, for all those um, thoughts. There's lots of different things you set us up to ask about of different directions we uh, can go with the questions here. So um, I just want to remind people in the audience to uh, you can use the Q&A button there at the bottom of the screen to submit your questions. And we'll get to the questions in the Q&A um, using the Q&A function there in just a couple of minutes. Um, but for our first questions, I'd like to turn to, we have two student officers from the CSUB Pre-Law Society um, who will give the first two questions here, Daisy Alamillo and Thomas Mitchell. Um, Daisy is the president of the CSUB Pre-Law Society. And Daisy, um, please start us off. Thank you, Dr. Olson. Um, so my question to you is, in January to, um, 2023, CSUB and all the other CSUs will now offer abortion by medication techniques on campus. However, what are options for what, um, however, what options do college students have in other states where abortion rights are limited? Um, so not a lot, right? Um, so Obviously, um, if you if you are in a state where abortion is a crime and someone offers you abortion medication, they're probably committing a felony. Um, it's it's pretty extreme in some states. So in Idaho, for example, um, Idaho has a very strong prohibition on um, financial support for abortion, as the state puts it. And the University of Idaho has interpreted that to mean that students cannot receive any birth control, including condoms, through the university health services unless the student claims that the, those contraceptives are being used to prevent sexually transmitted diseases. Because the university's position is that any kind of birth control could be conceived as violating um, an anti-abortion policy. So um, it's even more complicated potentially for students who, who go to school in places like California, but are from states where abortion is illegal. At the moment, those states have either 
explicitly said, we're not going to punish people for having abortions. We're only going to punish people for helping with or performing abortions. Other states aren't really clear about what they're doing. Like in Georgia, for example, Georgia's law doesn't say if it's going to punish people for having abortions or not. So students, you could imagine if you're a student from Georgia going to one of the CSUs and you have an abortion in California, you're going to wonder, you know, what happens if somebody finds out and I go back to Georgia, am I going to get into trouble? And I mean, the answer is probably not, but we don't really know. So I think that it's creating a lot of uncertainty um, for college students in large parts of the country. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next up we have Thomas Mitchell, who's the Vice President of Pre-Law Society. Hello. Uh, so women are clearly more directly affected by abortion decisions than men. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm curious, in the essence of equal rights, do you foresee states taking both biological parents' wishes into account? Um, yeah, well, I mean, yes, but not really. I mean, I think that the current business model in, is either in states that are opposed to abortion to just say you can't have an abortion. So, I mean, there was a moment in time when people in the anti-abortion or pro-life movement's proposal was to say, you know, maybe people can get an abortion, but not if if the the male parent objects, right? And that would have been something kind of more like what you're describing, at least not everyone would view it that way, but like you could view it that way. Now, essentially, I think you see a lot of states saying, we're not interested in what either parent has to say, we just think this is a crime, period, right? There's no kind of opting into this, it's just a crime. Um, and so now there, neither parent really gets to have an override of that in any state. And that's true across the board, even in what you would sort of consider to be battleground states like Florida, to the extent those states have struck a compromise, it's been that they've they've passed bans that don't kick in as early in pregnancy, right? So they've passed bans at like 15 weeks versus, you know, fertilization or something. Um, but there hasn't been yet, and that's an interesting point, there hasn't been an effort to um, get buy-in from both parents. It's just been saying, you know, we as a state think this is immoral. We're not asking the parties involved anymore. We're asking, you know, the people who are running the state legislature <laughs> ostensibly, that's who's getting to make the call. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got some questions in in the queue in the queue here for um, from the audience, and I'll I'll read a few um, of these to Professor Ziegler, and he, please feel free to submit more questions here. Um, so the first one, um, I think maybe we should start with with election coming up in California. This question comes from uh, Jessica Price, who writes that with California already having abortion protections in place. What are the changes or benefits of passing Prop 1 um, it's on the ballot this fall in California? Yeah, so I mean, Prop 1, the argument for Prop 1, well, okay, one thing that Prop 1 does is it talks about not just abortion, because I think the protections in California law, interestingly, are centered on abortion. And Prop 1 is broader in that sense. It talks about contraception, and it also talks about forced contraception. So California, um, interestingly and unfortunately, has had a history of um, forcibly sterilizing some people in prison, which is something that I think has been um, horrifying to people who are both pro-life and pro-choice. They don't think that people should be forced for sort of eugenic or financial reasons to be sterilized. So Prop 1 says, you know, not only it, it has language about abortion and it has language about access to contraception and protection from forced contraception. So that's one difference. It's broader in terms of, you know, when it's talking about reproductive freedom, it's talking about more than just abortion. The other argument people make for Prop 1 is essentially that it would be it's state constitutional protection. So it's not just a statute that makes it harder to appeal. And it also means that if you had, for example, in other states, there's been what's called a sanctuary city for the unborn movement where individual towns will ban abortion. Um, and even in states where abortion isn't illegal, that may not be permissible anyway, but if Prop 1 passes, the argument would be that um, you could then say this local law is not only potentially in conflict with California state law, it's straight up unconstitutional under California law. Obviously, you know, the benefits of Prop 1 are not as significant as, say, like in Michigan, where you have a similar state constitutional amendment 
on the ballot. Michigan, if you don't have that state constitutional amendment, is going to have a ban from fertilization, right? So the stakes there are very, very high. The stakes in California are more modest, but there are differences between um, Prop 1 and, um, and, and there's also, I think, um, some sense that Prop 1 doesn't have a, cl a, a clear stop at viability. Um, it doesn't necessarily say you can have an abortion after viability, it just doesn't say anything about viability. And so for people who are opposed to Prop 1, that's, I think, a point of concern. People who support Prop 1 say, you know, nobody really liked the viability limit anyway, and the fact that it's not in there doesn't mean much one way or another. It's just a flawed framework we didn't want to adopt. But that's, I think that's another potential distinction. Yeah, and so for people who are not aware, currently, Cal if you just say California law does have this limit on viability with some exceptions mm -hmm. um, in place, correct? Right, correct, yeah. Okay, so um, next question we have here. This is one you you touched on and uh, some of the things that you mentioned in um, in your talk, but perhaps can um, say a bit more. This is from uh, Britt McDill, who writes, are we being teed up to see the slow or maybe rapid erosion of our unenumerated rights? Maybe, right? I mean, I think, um, so from the, from the standpoint of intellectual consistency, yes, right? If the court is serious that the only rights we have are the rights that were recognized in the late 19th century, a lot of unenumerated rights would be questionable, right? Um, and in fact, the justices themselves have said in dissent in lots of opinions on these rights that those decisions are wrong because they wouldn't have been what people thought in the late 19th century. If that isn't going to happen, it's either going to be and this is the cynic and historian in me for political reasons, right? Because the court would be too afraid of the kind of backlash they would incur if they said, oh, by the way, like you can ban contraception um, or, oh, by the way, you can tell same-sex couples that their marriages are void. Um, or they're going to say that the reliance interests are different, right? That people's lives would be more upended if the court were to take this kind of decision. Um, I don't think we're going to know the answer to this for a few years, because I think this is a question of, um, what may seem too radical today could not seem too radical in a few years. If you had asked many people two years ago if the court would overrule Roe v. Wade as quickly as it did, people would have said, well, that's just not realistic. Whether they thought it was desirable or not, they would have just said, no way that's going to happen. So I think we won't really know. Um, and in part, it's just going to be a matter of court politics, because clearly Justice Thomas um, and I would assume based on things he said publicly, Justice Alito want the court to go further. Um, Justice Chief Justice Roberts definitely does not. And so I think at the moment, it's a battle for the votes of Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett. Um, Justice Kavanaugh, for the moment, quite clearly doesn't want to do those things, but he's also fairly changeable, I think. So I think we won't know for a few years whether uh, there are going to be more unenumerated rights eliminated or um, whether it's going to stop with, uh, with Roe itself. Yeah, I'll get back to the queue here in a second, but I think one of the things that you said was so fascinating when you think about in Supreme Court opinions that it seems, you know, stated as a matter of principle, and you're talking about how the kind of political aspect that goes into these mm -hmm. seemingly very principled statements, so like Kavanaugh, for instance, and as you mentioned, Alito said, what's different about this case is dealing with fetal life, unlike some other kinds of cases, but what you're saying, there might be some kind of malleability there with that kind of yeah. decision. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, Kavanaugh, just to give you an example, two years ago, the court struck down an abortion regulation that wasn't that sweeping a regulation. And Kavanaugh's opinion in that case wasn't, you know, only person who said we should overrule Roe was Clarence Thomas. And that was not because he's the only person on the court and the majority in Dobbs at the time. He was just the only person who was willing to say so publicly. And Kavanaugh at the time said, well, maybe we would have to strike down this law, but we need more facts before we can figure it out. And that's a very different tune than the one he was singing in Dobbs. So we don't know behind the scenes what people are thinking versus what they're willing to say publicly. And we know that there's kind of, you know, different factions within the court's conservative wing. And I think that was evident this summer. Many of you know there was a leak of a majority opinion in Dobbs, which was followed by other leaks about who was the source of the leak and whether the court was moving away from its opinion. And so, I mean, I think there's there's much of, there's a deep sense that the court's collegiality has been damaged and that kind of politics within the court are higher stakes and more visible than they were even in the past. Okay, next question here is from Elias. So I'm teaching a bioethics class this semester, and Elias, um, this may be the student Elias in my class, my bioethics class, mm -hmm. but he's wondering about um, what do abortion laws currently say about doctors performing abortions? Mm 
and what they what kind of rules restrict or what rules are in place for doctors making decisions about that and um, how that conflicts or does not with the Hippocratic Oath and um, what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, well, so, I mean, it's interesting because um, states that ban abortion um, zero in on doctors, right? So a lot of them say, essentially, if you perform an abortion, you've committed a serious felony. In Texas, that can be, um, you'd be subject to life in prison. Um, so, and the same goes for medical professionals who'd be aiding or abetting abortions. Um, in states that have abortion, have legal abortion, um, most of them have, uh, I think, both at the federal level and often, at, but not always at the state level, their their conscience opt outs for people who find abortion to be either contrary to their religious beliefs or morally objectionable. These were kind of like the heartland conscious protections that emerged even in the 70s and on a kind of bipartisan basis. Um, I think the the Hippocratic Oath point is is a, a tricky one because obviously for people who are pro life it would be a deep violation of the Hippocratic Oath to perform or assist in an abortion. For people who are not right, who take a different view about fetal life, um, not performing an abortion can be a violation of the Hippocratic Oath. And so I, I think um, it's just one of the many ways in which this is sort of a Rorschach test that people's views about what abortion is. Um, and what fetal life is and when life, not when human life begins, I think there's no dissensus about that, but um, when the life of a fetus or unborn child is of such value that you would potentially do something that could harm or negatively affect a patient, there's so such deep disagreements about that, that I think the same goes for how people perceive the Hippocratic Oath in this context. Thank you. Um, okay, this question is from Luke Burdick. Um, asking about the kind of differences again between states. And so the question here is, would someone who lives in a state where abortion is legal be able to move to another state where it's not following an abortion? Um, or would their previous abortion become criminalizing? Well, so in most states, um, again, either the scenario is that a state has said, we're not going to punish you for having an abortion. So like in Texas, almost anybody involved in an abortion but the person who had it could go to jail, right? So if you have the abortion and you move to Texas, nothing is going to happen to you. If you move to Georgia, uh, not nothing is going to happen to you, but you're not going to go to prison for it. Um, if you go to Georgia, then maybe you go to prison, but probably not. Then a lot is going to depend on who your prosecutors are, who your sheriff is. There's a lot more discretion involved. Um, if you change the hypothetical, like say you you feel really strongly about legal abortion and you live in California and you say, you know, I'm going to donate to an abortion fund in Texas. And then that abortion fund uses the money. Then you move to Texas. You may, I mean, they'd have to know you did something, but then you may face criminal charges. Um, the, the interesting question then is like, can Texas do that? Right. I mean, is Texas allowed to say our laws trump California's laws? And the answer is that we don't know. Um, and there are different layers of uncertainty. There's unconstitutional uncertainty because the right to travel is involved. We have very little case law on what that means. The, what's called the negative or the dormant commerce clause is involved. The dormant commerce clause is when states interfere with commerce in other states. The status of that is very unclear. And then there's what's called choice of law doctrine, essentially when states are duking it out about whose law applies. We don't have a lot of guidance about which state wins in that situation either. So the reality is in, for people in a lot of these situations that they just don't know, right? They don't know if they're in legal jeopardy or not. Um, and those are the risks I think people have to decide to take or not. Uh, you'd mentioned the, the Texas law there. And I think one thing that I think interesting from the legal perspective or thinking about this is the way that Texas wrote that law, like you were saying, or at least initially, that it could be, you know, fellow citizens turning each other in. And in California, one issue has been, can they write a comparable law for something like yeah. gun rights in California? I don't know if you can speak yep. to that aspect, whether sure. you think that kind of legal strategy applies beyond abortion, or if that's really just was something in this case, because enough justices already had in mind that they were gonna repeal uh, Roe v. Wade. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, again, the cynic in me thinks that it was probably because there were already enough justices who wanted to get rid of Roe v. Wade. But again, if they're being intellectually consistent, um, it should apply, right? So the reason that the, this strategy was devised this way, so usually when you pass a law, the state enforces the law, right? Um, with either you know criminal sanctions or fines or whatever. Um, in this case, Texas said, okay, the state, 
cannot, like no state official can enforce this law, but literally anybody else can. So, it, you know, people can, who have absolutely nothing to do with this abortion can sue people who perform the abortion um, for at least $10,000 a pop. Um, and the reason that the state did this was not only because it would discourage people from having, like helping people get abortions, but also because then they could say essentially, you can't bring a suit in federal court. Um, the only way you can sue the state in federal court is if a state official is enforcing an unconstitutional law. And here the state is saying ostensibly, well, the state's not doing anything, so you can't bring them to court. So California is trying to use the same strategy and say, well, now we're going to let people, you know, again, random people sue gun manufacturers. And if the gun manufacturers want to do anything about it, they can't go the fastest, easiest route, which is federal court, because the state's not involved. It's the same strategy. So I think in a way, it's kind of seeing if how if the Supreme Court is going to be intellectually consistent about this, because if they are, in theory, there's not much of a difference between what California did and what Texas did, other than in one case, it's about guns, and in another case, it's about abortion, but that shouldn't matter. Um, I, I think, I'm sure, I sort of suspect that the court will find a way to distinguish the cases, but in theory, they shouldn't, right? In theory, they're very similar. Okay, let me go back to the queue here. This is this question is from Amanda Chang, mm -hmm. who writes, um, Oregon, California, and Washington announced earlier this year that they made a multi-state commitment to reproductive freedom, including contraception and abortion. My question is, what stops other pro-choice states, those who oppose the repeal of Roe v. Wade, from forming together to make their own commitment? I mean, nothing, really. And I mean, some states are. I think what's happening, in effect, is not as well publicized, but a lot of states that support reproductive freedom are borrowing from each other. So a lot of the laws that Governor Newsom just signed on this were um, versions of them had been considered or debated or passed in places like Massachusetts and New York. So there isn't really a pact per se, but I think there's a lot of policy work where everybody is copying everybody else's homework because the same reform ideas are getting a lot of play. And I think that's true. Um, to some degree, it's true among conservative states too, although I think it, it, there's less consensus there thus far. Okay, um, so there was a, another question that had come in from Britt McDill earlier. What impact does the independent state legislature's theory have on the movement to pass a national law permitting abortions in all states? Well, I mean, so the independent legislature doctrine, um, and some folks may not know what it is, but essentially it, it, it deals with the balance between um, state courts and state legislatures, particularly with matters regarding elections, and the U.S. Supreme Court has a case on this before it this term. Um, so the effects, I think, would mostly be indirect in the sense that it would give state legislatures more control over elections, both in terms of certifying federal elections and presidential elections and also state elections. And obviously, you know, what laws look like in states and what laws look like nationally, right, like whether there'd be a national abortion ban, will have a lot to do with who's in office. Um, so if the Supreme Court does give state legislatures more power to essentially override election results, even when state Supreme Courts say what they're doing is impermissible, that could have knock-on effects in, you know, with respect to abortion along with a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so that's probably the most immediate way. I think we're unlikely to see in the short term um, we're, we're not likely to see a federal statute protecting abortion rights, and if we are, the U.S. Supreme Court is likely to strike it down. Um, and we're not, I don't think we're that likely to see a federal ban on abortion, both because Republicans seem to think that's bad politics. Maybe the Supreme Court would strike that down too, and either way, everybody would have to get rid of, rid of the filibuster. So I think if you're looking at where a national ban would come from, um, it's most likely to come from the Supreme Court eventually, less so, I think, than from Congress. Okay, thank you. There, so there's another question um, from an anonymous attendee here about, I think, so California has said in having the intention of becoming an abortion safe haven state. So mm -hmm. thinking about that, and what that would mean and how successful California would be with that. So the kind of um, question here is especially, you know, thinking about like, so if a different state like Idaho, you had mentioned before, wants to subpoena a doctor from California, they won't have the means to enforce their own laws is the question, right? Or that's the way they've framed it here. Wondering how successful 
California and how far California could go in becoming a, a safe haven state? Well, I mean, I think that California has about the best laws you could have to be a safe haven state, but there's no such thing. I mean, safe here is like relative, right? Because we don't know, for example, um, if California says we're not going to extradite doctors unless they're fugitives, right? That's probably going to work, but we don't 100% know, right? And even if that's true, that would mean that a doctor in California or someone who is accused of or subject to, um, you know, a warrant or something like that wouldn't be able to travel to the state where um, that warrant has issued. And of course, you have, again, some of these disputes are going to go to the same Supreme Court that overruled Roe. Um, the other area I think of, of potential issue for California is if you had, for example, a Republican presidential administration, you know, in 2024 or 2025, uh, and you did have a federal ban on abortion or you did have federal legislation, um, that might preempt what's going on in California. You could imagine a different Food and Drug Administration prohibiting um, abortion pills, right? So I think um, there's a sense often that people have that what happened, that votes for Congress don't really matter when it comes to abortion because Congress isn't passing legislation protecting abortion. Um, and that, you know, I don't think it's wrong to say Congress isn't, isn't the main area of activity, but who's in power in the White House and in Congress, I think would still have potential effects in California because federal law would likely override whatever you have in California, including Prop 1. Um, so we're we're coming up at to seven o'clock here. We're going to wrap up right around uh, seven o'clock. Um, and so maybe just to kind of wrap things up here, I, you had mentioned a whole bunch of things of thinking about potential areas that this could expand or thinking about in the future, whether that's things like IVF or with miscarriages or other things. I think maybe to kind of close here, if you could think, what do you think are the sort of the most likely next steps that we might see either from Supreme Court or, you know, kind of I, maybe if we stick there, what do you think they might take up next as far as this goes? I think that's going to take a while. I think they're going to be dragged into it against their will in cases involving um, either the clashes between the federal government or clashes between the states. Um, and I think other than that, the other area of main action is going to be not just in state legislatures, but ballot initiatives. So Prop 1 is just one of the ones we're seeing. We're seeing these in places like Kansas and Michigan, too. And I think that those could be a really promising tool because one thing that we found is when you ask voters just what do you want with abortion, not like do you want abortion to be legal so badly that you have to vote for a Democrat, you get different answers then sometimes because in Kansas we learned that there are lots of folks who are identifying as independents or even Republicans who didn't want to have an abortion ban in Kansas. They probably wanted Republicans and legal abortion, right? And so I think um, that's a useful tool to essentially say, maybe we can take some of the, the ugliness out of this by letting voters decide on the issue in isolation, right? Instead of in the kind of ugliness of partisan politics. So that's something else I'm watching. I mean, I don't think that's going to be satisfying to lots of people, but I think it may be a little bit, like it may be something that doesn't deepen the polarization that's afflicted this area for so long. Maybe if I can ask you just one more thing here, because sure. I think the question came in of thinking about this too, and this may relate to different laws being passed about this, but one attendee also asks about thinking things where, so Black women, for instance, have higher rates of maternal mortality than other groups, and thinking about um, sort of other kind of life-threatening mm -hmm. complications people may have, and if there's kind of public health steps or other laws of thinking about that kind of aspect of this kind of how this decision too can impact different group, groups disproportionately. Yeah, I mean, there's hugely disproportionate effects. I mean, and there are different reasons for that. I think um, you have a large percentage of people who have abortions are not just people of color, but people who live below the poverty line. Um, that in itself is telling us that the system is failing somewhere. It's not that pe people who are low income, people of color want to have more abortions. They're probably having abortions more often because the system is failing them in some way, right? Because of racism, because of poverty. Um, and so those are, of course, are people who are much more likely to be affected by criminal abortion laws. That's true both because those people tend to be more likely to have abortions, but also true because those are people who tend to have more interactions with the police, just statistically. Um, and in large parts of the South, right, um, where the harshest abortion laws have been passed, and that wasn't always true historically, by the way, like if you look at the anti-abortion movement of, say, like 
the 60s and 70s, it was the strongest in New York and Michigan, Minnesota, and Pennsylvania. 2022, the movement is the strongest in places like Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi. Those are places that have by far the worst maternal mortality rates in the United States. And maternal mortality rates that are objectively bad for anywhere in the world, including in developing countries, especially for Black women. Um, they're also places that have the worst outcomes for children after birth, um, particularly children who are low income. So we're likely to see after Dobbs, I think, a growing gap in outcomes between people um, of different races, but also people of different races living in different zip codes. Because ironically, in places like California, what you're seeing is um, pro-life and anti-abortion groups saying, okay, well, we're going to try to eliminate the reasons that people want to have abortion. So we're going to be for like more paid family leave. And then in states like Louisiana, you're seeing pro-life groups saying, no, no, we're definitely not doing that. We're going to do more criminal punishments. Maybe in Louisiana, they were even considering punishing women and pregnant people, right, for having abortions. So I think you're likely to see um, the gap in things like maternal mortality rate for people of color increase even more. Um, and that makes it important for people who care about this issue, regardless of what they think, to care more about maternal mortality for people in marginalized communities, because it's something that I think is and it's a national embarrassment and it's something you should be unhappy about regardless of what you think about abortion. Well, thank you very much for being with us tonight. I'm Mary here and um, there was a question about recording and so we have a Kegley Institute of Ethics YouTube page where you can access the, the this uh, talk afterward. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight, everyone, and um, we've got more events coming up with the Kegley Institute of Ethics. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight and hope you're able to uh, join us for the next one. So have a good night, everyone. Thank you.